Hey, everybody, if you're listening now or if you're listening later, um, we are going to read chapter five of Countdown by Deborah Wiles. Uh, chapter five starts with a poem written by Lieutenant Colonel John McRae, and he was a World War I veteran. And I think this gives some background um, about Uncle Otts. So we're going to start this chapter with a poem, and it's called In Flanders Fields. Now, I want you to listen to the poem, and as we're listening, I want you to think about um, Uncle Otts and what he's going through and what the soldiers of World War I would have faced. I can show you the page. In Flanders fields, the poppies blow between the crosses row on row that mark our place, and in the sky, the larks still bravely singing, flies scarce heard amid the guns below. We are the dead. Short days ago, we lived, felt dawn, saw sunset glow, loved, and were loved, and now we lie in Flanders fields. Take up our quarrel with the foe. To you from failing hands we throw the torch. Be yours to hold it high if you break faith with us who die. We shall not sleep, though poppies grow in Flanders fields. And again, that poem is called um, In Flanders Fields. You can look that up and read it again later if you want. So now we're going to get started with chapter five. I count to 100 and come out of hiding. I walk to the corner of Napoli and Cool Ridge and look left toward Judy James's house, Tom West's house, and the big woods at the dead end, the woods that hide the gravel pit. There are no kids in sight. Then I look right. No kids. I turn right and walk up the long stretch of Cool Ridge Drive by myself, hoping that kids aren't peeking out from behind their front curtains, drinking the chocolate milk after school, pointing me out to their parents and saying, see, there she is, Franny Chapman. She ran and hid from her crazy uncle. He's a nut. I pass the moors where I practice Christmas carols with all the neighborhood kids last December before I went caroling with them around the neighborhood. That was so much fun. Nobody even mentioned Uncle Lots. And we sang at my house too, sang my favorite Christmas carol, O Come All Ye Faithful. And then we wish you a Merry Christmas. Uncle Lotz came to the door and listened with tears in his eyes. He was so proud of me. He was better then. I walked past the Thornburg's house. They are the oldest people on earth and never come outside if they can help it. I scoot past Lynn Trinkle's house so she won't see me. We used to play canasta together when I first moved in, but Lynn is older than I am, and now that she's in junior high, she doesn't have time for me. And then I pass the house next to Lynn's that's been empty ever since Chris Kavas moved out a year ago. There's a moving van in the driveway, and two colored men are carrying an orange couch through the front door. New neighbors? I wonder if they have kids. Isn't that what you guys wonder if somebody moves in nearby? Margie, who lives next door to me and across from the new neighbors, doesn't wave at me from her mother's car as they pull out of her driveway. So I don't wave at her either. It's so warm. All of her car windows are down and the twins are jumping in the back seat and throwing things at each other. As soon as I open my front door, I hear the running water and the clacking of dishes and the sound of the vacuum cleaner. When you come through the front door, you're on a landing and you have two choices. A set of stairs going up to the kitchen lit and living room, dining room, my bedroom, Joe Ellen's, and mom and dad's room. Or a set of stairs going down to the family room, the laundry room, Drew's bedroom, and Uncle Lot's room. I take the stairs up. Joe Ellen turns off the Hoover when she sees me. She's wearing one of mom's aprons and her hair is wound in pin curls that peek out from underneath a wispy green scarf. Red alert! She says, her voice is low and her eyes are puffy. Everybody left like they'd been struck by lightning as soon as Uncle Otts banged through the door, blathering about spies in the bushes and blueprints in the mailbox. Jo Ellen wipes her nose with her apron and pushes the vacuum cleaner toward the hallway closet. Drew took him downstairs. Where's Jack? He's downstairs too. Have you been crying? I ask. Of course not, Jo Ellen says. Dishes crash against one another in the kitchen. In the kitchen, the roar from the faucet is so loud it sounds like Mom is washing dishes in a typhoon. Was it bad? She asks, nodding towards the street. Oh, 
terrible. He held everyone hostage. I'm embarrassed for life. I'm sorry, Squirt. Joellen winds the vacuum cleaner cord around its knob and sniffs. Take heart. You weren't standing next to Mom when Mrs. Ross flew out of here like she was on fire. She almost ran over Miss Hornbuckle. Was it bad? Mom had a stroke, Joellen says, her delivery picking up speed as she winds the cord faster. We heard the air raid siren from school. It was clear it was a drill and not an attack, but that was bad enough. They've never used that siren during the week, and that was when Uncle Lots came running in. Now Joellen is putting away the folding chairs, and I help her. She sounds compelled to tell me this. You look like you've been crying, I say. Is something wrong? Everything's fine, she says. Drew never should have checked the mail. It was the package for Uncle Otz that really set him off. My plans, he kept yelling. I've got the blueprints. Joe Ellen takes a breath. I told Mom it's just three tables of bridge, 11 silly wives. It's not important what they think. But she says daddy's up for promotion, and this will reflect badly on him when it gets back to all those colonels at the airbase. Really? How? I have visions of Miss Hornbuckle telling Captain Hornbuckle all about it at dinner. I don't know, Franny. Everybody knows everybody's business in the Air Force. Thank goodness we don't live on base. Joellen takes off her apron and drapes it over the banister. I've got to get out of these clothes. I'm going to a meeting on campus tonight with Lainey, and I'm going to forget all this. Go put your stuff away and let mom know you're home. She's been looking for you. And then, like she does it every day of the week, Joellen opens the cigarette holder on the coffee table, picks up the lighter, and lights a cigarette. You're smoking? Joellen shrugs and exhales. <sighs> Hurry up, she says to the sound of dishes clattering into the drain board. Joellen is the smartest person in our family. She looks like that gorgeous Marianne Mobley, the Miss America from Brandon, Mississippi, the town where Aunt Beth and Uncle Jim live. All the boys in high school were in love with Joellen, but she's taking her time finding a beau. Mom always tells me to Joellen, Mom always tells me Joellen is level-headed in a voice that implies I'm not. Joellen spent all of last summer in Mississippi. We came home and left her there. I don't know what she did because there is nothing to do in that tiny town where Miss Maddie lives. Nothing. Nothing at all. I missed her like crazy, and I think Mom did too. And ever since she went off to college, there's been something strange about Joellen. I can't say what it is, but I can feel it. Something different. What do you think Joellen did? All summer long in rural Mississippi in what year are we in? 1962. Hmm. So the next part of the book gives us some primary resources, and I'm going to do my best to try to show those to you on the camera. So this one is about an American U2 spy plane, and you may have to kind of pause the video so that you can read that. Then we have Miss Mary Ann Mobley, the beauty queen. We can ask an adult, que sera, sera. Yes, I just said that. Yes, I know it's cringy. It's okay. Okay. All right. So, hmm, Students for a Democratic Society or the SDS held its first convention in June of 1962. That's a pretty big clue about what might be going on with Franny's sister. So here we have students in the Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. I want you to take a look at that picture and decide what you think they might be doing. And here we have um, a quote that says, we have three ladies on loan to us from the National Park Service who catalog every single item in the White House, so we'll be sure nothing is lost track of again. And that is a quote from Jacqueline Kennedy, and she was the wife of John F. Kennedy, so she was the first lady. The students have decided that we can't let violence overcome. 
We are coming into Birmingham to continue the Freedom Ride. So this was when they burned out one of the buses. And this is during one of the Freedom Rides. And this took place in the rural south in 1961 and 1962. You might want to look up the Freedom Riders to see who they were and what they were trying to accomplish. So here we have um, like a button, like a medallion that you might wear or a pendant. And it says, the future's not ours to see. What will be, will be. And that, you might want to look this up as well and see if you can start piecing together what Joellen's doing. And then we'll come back next time for chapter six. Have a great day.